Welcome to a new Orange Dragon Gaming video series. In this particular video series, we're going to be playing Pokemon Sword for the Nintendo Switch, as well as looking at it in a couple different perspectives. We're going to be looking at it through the eyes of a gamer, which is what we're typically doing when we're playing a video game, and then we're also going to be looking at it from the developer's perspective. Why did why did this happen this way? Why is this mechanic working this way? Why do why does the game function the way it functions? Not necessarily the content of the game, but the the structure. So the way I always I think about it is the story is kind of like the main dish, but you know that when you get to eat it, you get to take it in, you get to experience it, you get to experience the steak, you get to experience the mashed potatoes and the vegetables on the side. Um, but you don't get to appreciate the story unless the structure of the game, so the mechanics, the core game loop, things like that, you know, basically the cooking process of the game makes sense and works together well. And then there's the polish, which is the equivalent of the seasoning. So the little, the little touches of, of refinement that go into the making of any video game, but in particular the Pokemon games, certain elements that they that they keep up, certain elements that they don't keep up, things like that. So, if for instance, we kind of skipped ahead, we've gotten past the, the kind of the default opening of the game, and started shortly after we were able to actually do anything useful. Um, so we made a short journey over to the first town, Wedgehurst, getting greeted by, or getting introduced to Hop's brother, the champion Leon. And one thing I will say about these games, they Sword and Shield have their flaws. Um, quite frankly, they're a little too easy, especially when you know you compare them to the first three generations of Pokemon games. Even the fourth generation, th there was a giant power creep at the end of that game um, that you had to overcome. But regardless, um, the game is really technically sound. And what I mean by that is that it the way that the mechanics work together and that the way that they're they all kind of come together and mesh together is very nice and smooth like i said this game does have flaws it's, but all in all a lot of the technical strides that they made forward are things that are going to make the generation 4 remakes so much better they're going to make the next generation whether they do um whether they jump to generation 9 with a with like a generation 5 remake and a brand new region or whatever they choose to do and i hope that some of the stuff that they did uh, the technical advancements that they made for sword and shield are going to be brought into legends arceus which is going to be a very interesting title in and of itself but like i said the, this opening i believe is very well scripted very well put together you, you get it's a new take on the opening of the game where you know you meet the professor the professor's either in some kind of distress or he needs you to run an errand here, take this Pokemon with you. No, instead you get a different look at it. You get the champion that's like, Hey, you're my little brother and his best friend. Why don't you guys start your journey? And here you go. And of course, we start with the, the classic tertiary... Not tertiary, the yeah, classic trio of typings, water, fire, and grass. Why anybody willingly picks Score Bunny is still beyond me. To me, it's all about Grookey and Sobble. And like little stuff like this. Like this this whole little introduction to the starters. It's cute. It's it's great. It's adorable. It's good stuff. And then you get to kinda you know, you, you get to look at the Pokemon in a different way. They're not just in a lot of games you just kinda look at them as tools of war. There are means to an end. And this, it, it, it kind of makes you feel an attachment, which is something I don't feel like the previous games did a very good job of doing, making you feel overly attached to your Pokemon, with the exception of maybe Pokemon Yellow or Let's Go Eevee and Let's Go Pikachu, which again are just basically yellow remakes. Um, and no, yes, I did just say I don't know why anybody willingly picks Score Bunny. I don't have score bunny data for my Pokedex, so this is step one of finishing out the Pokedex for me. And I mean the national Pokedex, so all 890 whatever Pokemon we have currently available to us. 
So one thing that I find interesting is this, um, they're, they're, you know, it, by default in all the Pokemon games, you end up battling your rival pretty much right away in the game. What I find very interesting is that the way that they, they've set them up for the last couple of generations is that you have an advantage going in as opposed to the other way around where your, where your rival would have the, the type advantage. So I pick Score Bunny, Hop picks Grookey, Fire Beats Grass. So that's interesting. And then the way that they set the first battle up, which um, we can skip forward to, well, I mean, I'm gonna let the game play out. But the way that they set up the first battle is also interesting because Hop already has a Pokemon and then he gains Grookey. So what's gonna happen then is I'm gonna battle his other Pokemon first, knock it out, level up, learn a move that gives me type advantage over Hop's Pokemon, and then use it to obliterate him. So the game sets you up for success early on. It's a way of keeping the player engaged, which I feel like is a misstep on Pokemon's part, believe it or not. Because, I mean, Pokemon, for all its greatness, there are the flaws of... It, it's, much, it's obviously not a flaw in their eyes. It's a flaw in my eyes. That they choose to cater towards kids, which I understand. But it'd always be nice if there was an alternate line of thinking when it came to the Pokemon games. And maybe we get some of it in Legends Arceus. I don't know yet. Obviously, none of us know it unless you're working on the game actively. So to me, the, this was a very nice leap forward, this battle system in particular. Granted, it's the same battle system over and over again, but the way it's presented, I feel like this is the right way to present Pokemon battles going forward. As you get full 3D models, if the environment is alive, like Leon standing off to the side. That's a detail that you didn't get to see that kind of stuff in any of the previous generations. You didn't see, you know, the crowds like at the stadiums or the gyms, even though they were technically there from everything that you can understand. So it's a very interesting take on it. Like, it's just literally like it's taking place right there off the side of the road next to Leon and Hop's house. But then the other thing I like is that, like, um, they, I think it was a couple of generations ago where they decided they weren't going to have the Pokemon stay still. They were actually going to have movements correspond with either physical or special attacks and even different ones for certain attacks in and of themselves. I thought that was a really smart thing. It just, it adds another, another little bit of depth and polish that takes a very good product and pushes it into the great kind of level. And then there are, you know, certain elements of, of the games that you just can't get away from. Like, you gotta go talk to your mom. You gotta let her know what's going on. And then for whatever reason, Dad's never around. Except for in Generation 3. Dad's never around. I wonder... I kind of wonder the origin of that in particular. Like, what's the deal there? Kind of like uh, Tom Cruise in basically all of his movies. He's got a dead father or a dead father figure. It's like part of what he has to do to be in a movie. And go back and, you know, if you if you can watch Tom Cruise movies and you like him, every single movie has got a dead father or a dead father figure. Mission Impossible, Jerry Maguire, The Mummy, like, all that stuff. He's got a dead father or dead father figure. Um, but there's just certain elements that Pokemon just, they cannot, they don't get away from 
and I think it makes them a little stale. Again, games are good, but we're, they're getting a little stale. Now this is something that I did like, is that you're not immediately just going on your journey. There's like a distraction first. So they kind of shook up the idea of what is entailed in the early part of the game. So, I'm gonna guess that people have probably played or seen enough of these games to where I can do this and I can give away things that are going to happen, things that will happen. Um, so, this is not going to be a spoiler-free type of situation. Um, one thing I did like is that early on in the game you get introduced to the legendary Pokémon of the game. Which, I actually think, is something they could play around even more for future titles. Um, just because it, it gives them a sense of there's this higher being, you know, not necessarily a godlike creature, but there is some higher being that at some point in time you're going to have to address. It's just a matter of if, when, and how the situation unfolds. There's the use of a repeated mechanic from the previous generation, I believe. That particular, like, a uh, hidden Pokemon was uh, originated in the sixth generation. I don't remember if it was XY or if it was the uh, Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire games that did it. Or there'd be just like a Pokemon tail or like a shadow visible within the tall grass. And there'd be something different about that Pokemon. It might know a different move outside of its normal skills or moveset or if it was rarer depending but it's something that I was I liked it just kind of made it feel special and once again you know the cat likes to interrupt
Okay, so everybody comes to, the champion discovers you, bails you out, gets you out of your tough spot. I don't mind the idea of the champion of the region being a decent human being and just wanting to help and be good. Um, and not, it wasn't always the case. Um, well, actually, sit there and think about it. And, uh, you didn't really know the champion of Kanto until you came to fight your rival. I don't remember Gen 2 too well. Generation 3, Steven. Steven was a pretty good egg. Generation 4, Cynthia was a good egg. Generation 5, I guess N was kind of that person. And N was misguided. Gen 6, he has XY, he had... He had a rival, right? Oh, well, he had that gang of kids. Tierno and Trevor and... them. Yeah, regardless. Um, I guess that statement of mine was misguided to start off with. Uh, but then the classic scene of... I gotta say goodbye to Mom. Just let Bob know that you're going to going away. Blah blah blah. Skipping forward a little bit uh, to where we can actually capture Pokemon. I'll never forget the uh, first time when Generation 3 came, when Generation 3 remakes came around. The first Pokemon I ran into, and I actually just moved it into my Pokemon Home account this morning, uh, was a Shiny Wurmple. First Pokemon I could run into that I could catch. Shiny Wurmple. It evolved into a Shiny Beautifly. Which, unfortunately, Shiny Beautifly is not the most aesthetically pleasing of the Pokémon that exist. Still, pretty cool. That was like the first... I'm pretty sure that's the first Shiny outside of Red Gyarados. Or in a distribution Pokémon through Mystery Gift or something like that that I've, that I've managed to come across. So that was pretty cool. And shortly after the catching of the initial batch of Pokemon, commences the initial beating down of Pokemon to start gaining some much needed experience to get your team into shape for the challenges ahead. Alright, so jump ahead again. Just to save some time, caught a couple more Pokemon, a Wooloo and a Grubbin. Nothing terribly exciting. Again, it's the first area of the game, so there's only so many species of Pokemon available to you. Um, everybody's all excited. Leon's in town. I make it a habit, for the most part, of venturing into people's homes to see if there's any free items that they're giving away or they got lying around. That's one of the weird staples of the Japanese RPG that I don't understand, is just the free reign and entry into other people's homes to look for stuff. I've always found that to be very bizarre. Not that I mind, because generally those items are pretty darn helpful, 
But it's still kind of weird to think that, no, oh, you know, I'll just walk into my neighbor's house, uh, you know, talk to everybody in there completely uninvited, do this, do that. It's kind of goofy when you think about it, really. Then you get introduced to another important character in the story. Arguably more important than than many. Sonya kind of takes the role of professor in this game. Even though there is a legitimate professor. So now we're in the next area on our way to visit the professor. Just kind of skipping ahead. Some of the the dialogue is not particularly particularly well written. It, it just it's it's very functional, but it's not very. I don't want to say artsy. It's just it's not it's not particularly deep. It, it gets you from A to B. There's nothing wrong with going from A to B. Especially in a Pokemon game where you know you're gearing your main audience towards kids, so you're generally keeping things a little more simplistic. But it's it's one of those things I'd like to see a little more effort put into. Kids are smarter these days. Like we, but I would say a lot of my generation in particular, we learned a lot of words, concepts, language constructs from video games. Pokemon, just fill in the Pokedex sheets. This is one thing that I'd like, the, um, kind of like that, here's the recommendations of Pokemon to catch based for the area that you're in, or where you're missing the most Pokemon. I liked that, that was kind of nice, just a, it's one of those things that you could, like, check off a, maybe, you know, kind of check it off. Not that the Pokedex itself isn't a giant checklist, but just, uh, just one, it made the Pokedex seem more attainable to complete because it broke it down into small chunks because the pokedex is daunting it's like 893 or 4 or 5 something like that pokemon or 898 something like that there's a ton of pokemon so anything to make that process seem a little smoother is nice i think Myself deep in the throes of battle with a vicious hootoot. If memory serves me correct, that is like the first fan inspired Pokemon. When they added them in Generation 2. It's kind of weird. Part of me wants to see like the, the unused Pokemon 
from generation from previous generations like proved to be some sort of science experiment or something like that gone horribly wrong wreak havoc they need to be taken care of in some way shape or form I think that could be an interesting little plot line to explore because let's face it they, we know that oh cool updated the Pokedex but we know that Mewtwo was created in the lab, so why can't other Pokemon have been created in a lab? Maybe things not necessarily as vicious and destructive as Mewtwo. Food for thought, right? Alright, well... I think we're gonna take a quick trip to heal here. Maybe stock up on some items. All right, looks like we're getting near the end of recorded footage for this particular time around. Oh, yep, there I am going for the save. Uh, so that being said, we will continue this with another video sometime in the near future. Let's stop it there. Thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. We'll see you next time.